Hello, welcome back. Um, first, I'm going to start with my paper two predictions. If and this is if you took the paper eleven test on Monday, so paper one time zone one. This would be specifically for you. Um, just based off what we saw in that test, this is my professional assumption of what will be on paper two. Um, and there's probably going to be some weird things that we're not sure of, like sulfur dioxide being a gas um, at room temperature. So that'll be an interesting answer to see in the mark scheme. I think it had something to do maybe with um, the specific heat capacity of water, but there it is. Um, I think it'll be density gradients, so temperature, salinity, or thermocline, halocline, the photo equation, and maybe even respiration. So just reverse photosynthesis and productivity. Cambridge loves a good productivity definition. <clears throat> um, classification, dichotomous keys, tides. They haven't covered any tides yet. Um, these are specifically for my students. The tropic level transfer efficiency formula. And you also haven't had to take a percentage yet off that paper one. So, and Cambridge loves having students do percentages. So portion over a whole, make sure that I would make sure that you practice that. That could also be within the trophic level transfer equation. Um, pyramids of biomass, pyramids of energy, pyramids of numbers, and mangroves. We haven't seen any of those. All right, and then for skills, um, none of these would have been on paper one anyways, but we need a recall graphing for the bar of the line graph. It potentially could give you a pie chart, and I've never seen one on a marine exam. But that doesn't mean that this year isn't the year for it. So that might be something, especially if you're my student, you want to brush up on. We covered a lot of that in January. Uh, biological drawings, I'm not thinking it's going to be a fish because you guys already had to label the caudal fin and pectoral fin on your paper one. So they're not going to test you on the same content twice. Uh, experimental design, creating data tables with, you know, within that experimental design or maybe even critiquing a data table that's given to you. There's your percentages again, and then population sampling. For population sampling, it's going to be um, potentially marker and recapture, which you would hope for. It's definitely the easier of them. Um, quadrat samplings with the frame quadrat for random sampling, looking at species uh, abundance. Uh, it could be sampling with a transect, and that could be continuous or systematic, and it could also be a belt transect. So those are the potentials. All right, um, first question. So this is from chapter one, section two, state two ways of measuring pH. And always look at your brackets and how many marks each question is worth. That will help determine that you know, if you think you might be missing something or you, there has to be somewhere else, that, you know, somewhere else you have to show your work to get those full marks. All right, those ways are, you can say, a pH probe. Oh, thank you. And, and I just got a letter from my daughter. And back because you can't really see them. Oh, okay, that's really yeah. nice. These are good, so don't pump them. Oh, you are the best mom ever. Thank you so much, Olive. And it says smart. Oh, gosh. Bless your heart, sweetheart. Thank you for being the best person. God bless you, Ellie. Thank you. She is six. Litmus paper. Um, there are limits to litmus paper. Litmus paper will just tell you if it's an acid or alkaline solution or base. It don't tell you specific pHs where the pH probe is best at that. Thank you so much, Ollie. Yeah, you're um, pH probe has its limits too, and then it has to be calibrated. It's the bane of my existence most of the time. Uh, the last one you could use is the universal indicator solution in this one you put um, a couple drops of this solution into whatever you're trying to test the pH of and it'll change the solution a certain color and then you have to compare the color to a chart that it comes with so that does also open up for some um, subjective opinions and so it's not as specific and where the pH probe is going to be the best but again it has to be calibrated so you're only as good as the person calibrating, and I'm not the best. 
And I honestly think for the best answers for this one to determine, the measure the pH, you're going to want to go with pH probe and then universal indicator. The litmus paper won't measure pH. It'll just tell you if something is alkaline or acidic. Okay, um, a student measured the pH using two different methods. <clears throat> and here's the results. So method one, we can see we have measurements to the tenths place. This is probably something that's from the pH pro. Method two, we just have some whole numbers there. And so I'm assuming this is a universal indicator. Um, so just why the student did not calculate the mean of the two methods. And that's because they weren't used, um, they weren't using the same method. And you can tell from their, their answers, what their, um, their data was. the methods to measure aren't or weren't the same. One mark. Okay, and another thing you can mention that means or averages, Cambridge prefers the word mean, it's just more academic, can or should only be calculated when you're using the same method. Should is a better word. The same thought. Okay. Dissolved nutrients affect the pH of water. Identify which sample came from um, J, K, or L, came from near a hydrothermal vent. And then from that answer, give reasons. Explain your answer. Hydrothermal vents release solution that is very acidic. So it's superheated water, literally, and I mentioned this in my other video, dissolves the crust of the earth and the minerals or the ions that it dissolves are extremely acidic. So there's hydrogen sulfide in there. Um, so you have like acidic gases that come out. And so you're going to look for something that has a low pH. K is going to be your answer. That is the lowest pH. Those are acids. And so our reason, water coming from a hydrothermal vent, HTV, hydrothermal vent, has dissolved minerals, or ions, you have a specific um, chemical like hydrogen sulfide um, that make the water acidic. If you were um, going to just say water coming out of a hydrothermal vent is acidic, you would get one mark, but you, you need to explain it. That you would, you know, if I was your teacher in that situation, I would say, but why? Why is the water coming out acidic? And it's all about the minerals that get dissolved in it. All right. If you're my student, then you'll know what I mean by this. This is a hungry wave question. Um, explain why, give reasons. The dissolved oxygen level in the surface of the open ocean is higher than the water near a hydrothermal vent. So why is there more dissolved oxygen at the surface of the ocean than in a hydrothermal vent? All right, um, you're not gonna have a question like this on Thursday because you already answered a question like this yesterday on paper one. Um, you answered it was like open ocean. So why would there be, um, give reasons, biotic and abiotic, I think why there would be a variation of oxygen in the surface. Okay, so this is your, your hungry wave question. Um, and it's literally eating atmospheric gases. And when the wave crashes, right, those gases get 
dissolved into the surface water. That's why it could be super saturated at the surface. And so it's carbon dioxide could also get, you know, dissolved in there, of course, and that happens all the time. But so could oxygen. All right, and things we wanna consider, um, so we want we want to answer this in terms of the open ocean waters being higher than near a hydrothermal vent. So we have biotic factors going into that. So there's a lot of light energy. So light energy, we link with photosynthesis. Oxygen will be released. Um, we have a lot of producers there that will be doing that. You have um, dissolution of the atmospheric dissolution because of wave action, and that's going to increase the dissolved oxygen there. Um, you're not going to have mixing between what's at the surface and then what's all the way at the bottom of the ocean where you have your cute little hydrothermals. You're really not gonna have any mixing. This is extremely deep. Um, oxygen is less soluble or gases are less soluble at higher temperatures and we know the water coming out of a hydrothermal vent is well past boiling point. So that in and of itself would cause there to be um, less oxygen there. Additionally, uh, the um, salinity. So all those dissolved sediments and dissolved nutrients or ions coming out of the vent would make the salinity high. And we know that high salinity has low gas solubility. It's ready for pickup. I figured I had an inkling. That's why I started putting the paint. Okay. All right, and um, we want to answer in terms of it being low. So you're not going to say hydrothermal vents have really high water pressures so that could increase the gas um, solubility. We're not going to answer in that way because that's not what they want. And so another way to make it low with the hydrothermal vent is by mentioning respiration, that you have organisms doing cellular respiration because they're alive and they need to do cellular respiration like everything else. We have organisms that are going to be the hydrothermal vent using up the oxygen and respiration. So let's answer it. It's high light penetration. And the surface. Uh, referencing photosynthesis or photosynthetic. Excuse me. Is there a spring top of water? Sure. All right. Atmospheric. And there's a number you can call when you get there, too. Like when you get there, you can pull in and be like, hey, I'm here. And I'll send, yeah, I'll send straight hot. Atmospheric dissolution. Mm -hmm. Another mark. Function saying, like, explaining that, like, how is there atmospheric dissolution from waves? Increasing O2 in the surface. There is low, um, like water mixing. Obviously, it's water. At uh, deeper layers. So, like at your hydrothermal vent. Again, preventing oxygen. From reaching HTV, hydrothermal vent. Temp is past boiling point. Okay, my iPad's really hot. I like it's charging right now. Crazy. Sorry, temp is past boiling point. Um, that hydrothermal vent causing 
low gas solubility. None of our fluids we want hot. None of our um, carbonated fluids we want hot because it's not going to hold its its gas well. Um, at HTV organisms do and actually everywhere cellular respiration but again we need to answer in terms of why it would be low there and we'll say using up oxygen because Cambridge is not going to assume that you say they're doing cellular respiration that you're linking that to the knowledge that you know that that uses up oxygen they're just never going to assume so explain 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 <laughs> Okay, and then we can, the last thing I'm going to mention is the salinities at HTV. Dissolved solids, which is the definition for salinity. Dissolved solids are high, which causes low gas solubility. The biological drawing. Second. The screenshot. My Instacart. Okay, thank you. Um, if I gave you this in class, um, that's why I did post these in your Google Classroom, because I know you can't see it to enough detail to get all these marks. So um, biological drawings, some key things here. Sharp pencils. Sharp, sharp, sharp. So sharp. Like, weapon sharp. And the best erasers you've ever seen. You'll lose marks if, and you'll lose a mark, not marks, but you'll lose a mark, if your eraser is not the best eraser. We cannot leave stray marks. So if you're using, like, I don't know, if you just go to, like, public school and you don't bring a pencil to the exam, don't let, you know, bring your own pencil and, and get a good one. I always recommend Ticonderoga. Um, they should sponsor me because more than half of my students um, on Monday were using Ticonderoga pencils, and they're just the Lamborghini of pencils. They're so good. So... Um, even though they have the yellow eraser, don't let it fool you. It is so good. and Not the yellow eraser, what am I saying? The pink eraser. Um, it's just so good, and it's such a good pencil. Anyway, you can't leave any stray lines. And so with that, I also recommend that you start this out. Um, you start this out really light and give yourself space to draw. Um, this is a good time whenever I start drawing that you speed this up because I haven't done this one before. And uh, even, you know, doing it on the iPad, I would actually prefer using a pencil, but doing it on the iPad, I still am going to have to give it a couple goes, I think. Um, so this, yeah, this would be a good time to speed this up. So we can't have any um, unbroken or broken lines. So what that looks like is if this is the shape that you needed to draw. Look at that trash. We can't have that. Um, and this is very simple because it's just an oval shape, but like when you had to do, if you saw previous papers, the May, June paper 21, um, they had to do like a, a butterfly fish. So, uh, a little bit of a challenge, no, no broken lines, um, no sketches, no sketching lines. So things like this. None of that it needs to be like clear continuous lines with a very sharp pencil. All right, um, it needs to be bigger than this uh, than this picture itself. So if you can double the size, that's good. And if it's an, um, something that you can double accurately on your page, then I recommend using a ruler. Somewhere I have a ruler. There she is. I recommend using a ruler so you can do proportions. That's a long ruler. Bring it back, bring it back. Goodness gracious. Okay. It's so like I'm starting at like the one right here. Oh, 
Okay, so it's about almost just it's almost five um centimeters. So I could then draw out my bottom one down here. I can make it ten. Um, that's you know I think I think this is actually gonna be extremely easy, and you're not gonna have to need to use that and get all these proportions right. But if it's like an actual organism, organism, and not just the shape of a diatom, uh, then definitely I would start doing the the ruler with the proportions. Looking how long different um, tails are, maybe maybe it's a sea star, and you're looking at how long their arms are. All right, let's do it. So you got to show appropriate detail. The detail that they're going to want you to include, and I'm going to erase it once I do it so I can look at this clearly. They want you to include um, this line right here. And if you're my, and you notice it doesn't touch in the middle, so there is a gap. Um, if you're in my class, then this, again, again, why I posted the full copy on your, like the full page on your Google Classroom so you could actually see this. Not like you're not seeing it really well right now. You are not to draw these pores. And it says that. Do not include the pores. Could you imagine? Um, don't label the drawing. There really wouldn't be anything to label because you did not have to know parts of a diatom. The details you do need to include are these. And so in the correct proportions, so they are um, off of the, this main um, middle groove. And so we need those white spots there. Um, the other spots that you need are the ones that are on the edges. So there's white structures that are distributed like around the edge. And there is a clear gap and they do emphasize that in the mark scheme. There's a clear gap to the outer edge of the diatom. So there is a gap like right here. And we need to make sure that that gap is shown all the way around. All the way around. These are the structures that they want you to show. Got it, got it, got it, got it. And they are getting smaller as they go towards the, the edge. Okay, you're not using any color. You're only using a pencil. Um, you never show depth, shade, um, like shading, no depth, and absolutely no color. Don't use a ruler on this, which is crazy for me to say because I'm a ruler freak. But you don't want to use a ruler on this because organisms don't have straight lines. It ends up just looking weird. All right, what I recommend for everybody, lightly with your pencil, give yourself and your ruler lightly though, so you can erase it and not leave any stray lines. <clears throat> Give yourself like a frame to do this in. Um, and that way, if you did have to label, but you don't, you still have space to do those label lines and it just looks cleaner. It doesn't look like you didn't plan this out right and now it's like going off the edge of the page. Okay, um, it's an oval shape. I don't love it, and I don't love it because I did go off the page here, but what I really don't love is, is um, the iPad. I didn't mean it. I do love the iPad. Um, this, this nastiness right here, that can't be. because that is not an unbroken line. Now this isn't a hard skill. You know, if we're gonna miss some marks, let's miss them on maybe labeling the different uh, molecules yesterday. <laughs> um, miss them on that ridiculous water and sulfur dioxide question. We're not gonna miss them on just taking our time on duplicating an image. And don't, if you're gonna get something that you, you know, you recognize, I think this die time is extremely easy. Um, because it's not something that you already have in your head, what a diatom looks like, but when people get a fish, you're, you're already thinking in your brain, like, okay, I know what a fish looks like. And then you start drawing what your brain has in terms of a fish. Um, and then we start messing up proportions. So have 
just look, have a, a good plan to just look at things in just their pieces. Everything is it's just different shapes. That's all, that's all structures are. They're just different shapes. And this is not about being a good artist. This is about using a really nice pencil. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of this on the outside. I don't need these guidelines anymore. All right, and I'm certain that if I had like a legit pencil, then I wouldn't have like these little squigglies. But you can see how I went through and tried to like, you know, straighten out this edge. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, college credits on the line. If you're trying to get a bright future scholarship in Florida, we're going to, we're going to draw the best, you know, you're going to give me bright futures. Everybody's an artist. Um, but for the sake of the video, I am just going to have to be okay with it. All right. So like in the middle, and this might be a good time to pull out your ruler so you can make sure that you're identifying where the middle is. I got a ton of stick cards are on their way. Okay. I did it again, didn't I? Didn't I do it? View. Ruler. Okay. All right, so it's by the center. Get out of here. Okay, and there is a gap. Okay, and then, and right, like, I'm dying to try and like show these shadows that are coming down the groove, like these right here, but that's, that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're doing. And we're going to do the dots around it. And you can count them. So it might as well. Um, you got one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And on this side, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and they're not, they're not all directly apart from each other. I'm not gonna worry so much about that. I just wanna make sure that I get nine. What do I got over here? I got one, two, three, four on this top side, one in the middle, one, two, three, four at the bottom. Okay, so I got the one in the middle. About how far off is it? Get that like right here. All right, something I'm considering too is like. Um, I got these ones done. The the ones I just did pink, but like how far up this one goes. Mm -hmm. And how far up that goes. And this one goes up a little bit higher. I mean, are they going to be like, oh, that dot isn't as high as the other one? No, but again, like the stakes are high and all this is is about taking your time and identifying what you see accurately. Okay, and now at the bottom, I'm gonna do the same thing. So at the bottom, I got one, two, three, four. Oh, I actually have five in that top. They're kind of smashed together. All 
and then out here. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. Okay. And then I got the lines I got to deal with on the side. Oh, okay. So they're obviously, you can tell they are longer at the center. At least that one is. I'm going to get shorter around. Okay. So I'm going to start at this area, this, at the, the middle line. And I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I got seven till I get to the, the top. What do they look like though? I'm going to sharpen my pencil. <laughs> and it can't touch the edge because there is a clear gap to the edge. Down here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Still the same thing, getting smaller. I'm gonna critique my own right now, but for the sake of speeding this along, I, I can't in good faith like leave this or this. There's no reason. Ugh. Let Cambridge think you never have lifted up your pencil. It's just always rested there. Okay, and again, for the sake of time, I'm going to stop there. So you see how I did that? Just... Get your basic shape when you're pleased with your shape, then add in details of things. The details that are required, um, the details they would expect. Sometimes it's hard to interpret, like what do they want me to show? They want me to show me too much detail, but they probably want detail. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, then that's where you're supposed to be a mind reader. You know, it's on the syllabus. Just, just, you know, do your best, do your best. Cambridge wants to award marks. So this is all about skills. They told you what not to include, but those white features are pretty dominant. So I would definitely include them. And the more that we see these types of questions, the better we can direct our students. Um, of course, you should definitely complete the edge. And I'm not just to speed this along, but you see my general plan on how I did this. Okay, diatoms are a possible source of biofuel. It's a good thing you could also use for your ACE environmental class if you have it. Sorry, seemed to mess with the Instacart. And if I pause the video, I am nervous that it's gonna um I'm sorry I'm nervous I'm just gonna like disconnect I'm just paranoid and then I have to do it all over again and I won't um diatoms absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere for photosynthesis so that means that they are a good um organism for climate control um biofuel so bio is life fuel obviously we need fuel for energy so we can use them as an alternative energy source um, with suitable growing conditions and nutrient availability diatoms produce large amounts of lipids lipids can grow um, the, or lipids can form 70 to 80 percent of their mass, so they could be predominantly lipids. Remember, lipids are a glycerol and then a fatty acid molecule, and they're made of carbon, hydrogen, and a little bit of oxygen. The biofuel of a population of diatoms can double in a few hours. Lipids can be removed and turned into biofuel to be used in place of fossil fuels like oil, coal, or natural gas. Okay, diatoms require silicates which is their nutrient. Silicates are also in glass as an energy, uh, sorry, as an essential nutrient to make parts of their cells. Some land plants also use silicates to make their cells. 
Other land plants will use cellulose to make their cells. Land plants that need silicates only use 8% of the energy to make their cells compared to plants that use cellulose. Scientists believe diatoms may have similar energy requirements to land plants that use silicates. Scientists believe that diatoms could have similar energy requirements to land plants that also use silicates. You might have to reread that a couple of times too. If, um, if, you know, if you were doing this on an exam, state the word equation for photosynthesis. So um, carbon dioxide. plus water yields. And it's also a good idea maybe to, you don't have to, it's it's not on this mark scheme, but if you wanted to say light energy, just keep yourself gold in there. And they release an oxygen and then, oh, I'm doing it. <laughs> you can do the formula and you won't be marked off. A levels where you have the balance formula. Okay, and this is in my class where I would say do the ta ta slide, but I'm too embarrassed to do it on here. Uh, describe the chemical structure of lipids, which I just did. So um, all lipids are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Um, it should be appropriate for you just to write out those letters, but if not, if you feel paranoid, then definitely write it out so you don't get a chance to explain yourself. So carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And they consist of a glycerol molecule and fatty acid tail. Um, two ways that silicates can replenish into surface waters. And so I always say, you know, don't let these, or there's a question always that also says, um, you know, uh, sorry, describe or explain how nutrients get replenished. There's, I mean, there's only so many things, right? Here's the ocean. So you have literally what's inside of the ocean, so the organisms. You have what's above the ocean, which is going to be your atmosphere. You have um, what's next to the ocean, which would be land. And then you have what's at the bottom of the ocean, which is sediment. And then you might also have some tectonic features, maybe a little hydrothermal situation, underwater volcanoes, that's it. So you have what's above it, what's next to it, what is within it, and what's below it. Those are the only things that can really affect it. And so to get it back into the surface waters, um, we can have things from the sediment, the seabed, come up, and that's called upwelling. It's a movement of cold, um, cold nutrient-rich water from the seabed to the surface. You could have runoff from land. And then if you have a producer that dies in the sur in, within the surface layers, um, decomposition. Decomposition doesn't have, have to happen at the seabed. It can also happen within the water column. A lot of bacteria in the ocean. Decomposition or decay. Okay. I'm going to preface that I don't love this next question. Before I go into that, um, notice that it suggests two ways. So I've already mentioned my other videos, but it's a list. It's only two. If you write four things and the first two are wrong, but the bottom two are correct, it does not matter. They're only reading the first two. All right, I'm oh, sorry, this question says scientists believe diatoms may have similar energy requirements to land plants that use silicates. Evaluate this statement. You don't have anything to evaluate it with, but these. So he said diatoms require silicates as an essential nutrient and to make part of their cells. Some land plants also use silicates to make their cells. Other land plants use cellulose to make their cells. Land plants that need silicates only use 8% of the energy to make their cells compared to plants that use cellulose. So it seems like it's more energy efficient, but that's not the question's asking. Scientists believe diatoms may have similar energy requirements to land plants that use silicates. And so evaluate is like, where is it good? Where is it not? Like, where is it not supporting? So 
one thing we can say is that they did mention that both types of producers, land plants and silicates, where both types of organisms have silica parts. So they use silicate. They said diatoms require silicates to make parts of their cells. Some land plants also use silicates to make their cells. So the statement um, may be justified. But honestly, you know, I, when I did this first, I kept rereading it, rereading it, like there's really not much there. <laughs> there's not really enough data and I, I feel like I'm just searching for something that isn't there, which is exactly what's going on. There really is not enough there. And so that is one of the possible answers. There's no scientific data. They just mentioned 8%. Um, not enough like investigation. That's a V to support. Um, and you don't know enough about both of them or about the land. They just said land. They didn't say a specific thing. Land and sea organisms. Maybe from different kingdoms. So I know, you know, the kingdom plantae, but like there might be like a sub, like or phylums, a sub phylum. Um, they have different habitats, they have temperature differences. So, you know, the energy that they are going to require may be different based on their enzymes at their temperature differences. Enzymes are all functioning based off temperature differences. So their energy requirements might be different. State to services that diatoms provide the environment. Services is a weird way to say it, I feel like, but uh, just have experience with this question. They're talking about like, how are diatoms helpful? So they are producers. We could go with, with our old faithful. They have, um, they provide climate control. Any plant can do climate control, even the sea grasses, and that's an economic benefit. They absorb CO2 so that mitigates the effects of global warming, and it also decreases the effects of ocean acidification, because CO2 makes carbonic acid when it dissolves in the ocean. One in and of itself is they absorb CO2. And I'm sure that would maybe also go to an ocean acidification. Acidification. They release oxygen, which all organisms need for respiration. Um, they are a food source. Right there, the base of your trophic levels. And so they maintain stable food webs or ecosystems. Finally, all right, state the name of a tertiary consumer found in the figure. We're looking at one containing diatoms. Trophic level one, always your producers. Trophic level two are your first eaters, the primary consumers. When students hear primary consumer, you know primary is one, and so they're like trophic level one. But that's not correct because trophic level one is always a producer. Whatever's eating a producer is the first eater, the primary consumer, and that's trophic level two. Likewise, when you see tertiary consumer, take your time. This means the third eater. 
and you guys haven't had a food chain or food web yet on your test so this could be something to also prep for a third eater so you, this is gonna be anything on trophic level four because that's including trophic level one being the producer okay state the name of a um you only need one so we'll just go through it we i'll start on the left side so we have diatom that's your producer fish larvae is a primary consumer herring there would be a secondary consumer and tuna is a tertiary consumer okay so tuna can be one and there the shark and that food chain is going to be trophic level five but it's the quaternary consumer moving over again diatoms primary producer anchovy um, in this situation with the diatom, it is uh, trophic level two, which is a primary consumer. Tuna is your secondary consumer, and shark is the tertiary consumer. Or in that feeding relationship, trophic level four. When the shark feeds on the tuna that is eaten, the anchovy, and the anchovy is eaten, the diatom is going to get more energy than if it's eating. The tuna after it's eaten the herring, after it's eaten the fish larvae, and the fish larvae fed on the diet. It's just, you lose um, about 90% of the energy moving up trophic levels. Or in other words, you are only gaining about, about 10%. Okay, and then the other ones, if you went diatom to crab larvae um, and, and to anchovy, that would be secondary consumer, be back to tuna again. So it's just me tuna and shark, tuna or. The energy held in each trophic level for one food chain is shown in arbitrary units. So the amount of energy that's in each different trophic level or feeding level, troph means feeder, these are your feeder levels, are shown in arbitrary units. That means random units. So it's not, instead of just putting a number with nothing with it, arbitrary means that it's like, it's random. Construct a pyramid of energy for this food chain, food chain label the pyramid of energy. So the trophic levels, that they're referencing are these right here. Notice they're the only ones with energy on it. And so the way that you do a pyramid, it's not like a staircase. You're going up the stairs, that's not what it is. Your uh, bars need to be centrally stacked. So it's also not a triangle at all. They need to be centrally stacked on top of each other and they need to be about like equal height. So like how tall you're making your bars. They need to be about equal height, so like right here. You don't need to use a ruler. I think with your hand, you could probably do a pretty straight line. Three marks, good deal. And then it says, label them, label them. Pyramids of energy, um, you're gonna follow the numbers that you see. So 136,000, um, 19, 1,900, 21, 10, 201, and 19. So we start at the bottom. Um, even without the numbers, we should know that pyramids of energy are always gonna have the biggest bar at the bottom. This might be different if it was a pyramid of numbers. Um, maybe you see that your producer number is really low for a moment, you know, just like a snapshot. And that's what they want you to write about. And that's because they can be consumed really fast. You think about like filter, like massive filter feeding whales. They can eat a lot of food really quick, but your producers can also reproduce really fast. So it's not like it's damaging to the environment. If it was the case, they wouldn't exist. So sometimes you can see very low numbers at your bottom trophic level, but never the energy. Pyramid of energy will never be low like that. Okay, so notice they're centrally stacked. Think wedding cake, not stairs. Okay, and you want five trophic levels. One, two, three, four, five. Got five. And then we need to label them. You can label on the outside. You don't need to label on the inside because you're never going to, sometimes the organism at the top, you can't fit its name in there. the other one fish larvae herring tuna
All right, and follow your numbers because if you have a pyramid of biomass, um, same thing. Um, that could also maybe look weird if the, the producer population is getting eaten really fast, but again, they reproduce really fast. Um, if it's a pyramid of numbers and you have a parasite, for example, if you had a shark, like if you had this same one, but it said do a pyramid of numbers, and on the shark you had like, you know, a ton of um, nematodes, then it could look like this because the sharks have big biomass and they could sustain a lot of smaller organisms. The energy transfer efficiency is the percent or the portion of energy held in one trophic level that gets passed to the next. Calculate and uh, trophic level trans, sorry, energy transfer efficiency from diatoms to fish larvae. Give your answer appropriate significant figures and show your working. So we're going diatoms to fish larvae. There are three significant figures in both of these values. 136,000, the one, the three, and the six are significant. These zeros are not. In fish larvae, the one, the nine, and the nine are significant. The other zeros are not. So we're going to do energy and current trophic level divided by energy in previous trophic level times 100 to get enough percent. And we're doing um, what fish larvae has, 19. divided by 136. All right, and if, you know, they're not real units, but if they were, they cancel times it by 100. All right, and so if you got 14.63, they did take that as a mark, so they're not, you know, completely obliterating anything because maybe you're not familiar with significant figures yet. Typically, you learn that in chemistry. But to have three significant figures, that would be the one, the four, and the six. If the three, you know, was a five or something, it would round the six up, but it's not. So you got 14.6% or 14.63. And something you should notice is that that is greater than our average 10%, right? The 10% rule in feeding relationships is that 10 about 10% 10 of the energy gets transferred from one trophic level to the next. Um, we see this one is more. And we might see other ones as being less than 10. And so this is what the next question asks. Why does that happen? So where's like where is that feeding relationship? And this is in um, chapter 3.2. The energy transfer efficiency from tuna to shark is 9.45%. So less than 10. But we're really going to be comparing it to the answer we just calculated. So why is it more efficient, essentially, for... Uh, fish larvae, zooplankton, fish larvae to be eating diatom, which is a phytoplankton, versus when a shark eats a tuna. So give reasons why the energy transfer efficiency calculated for the fish larvae eating the diatom is different from the energy transfer efficiency from tuna to shark. And so the first thing we're gonna say is they were pretty vague and we're gonna clear that up. They said, how is it different? We're gonna talk about specifically that it can be the reverse argument. You could say um, the tuna to shark is less efficient or the uh, diatom to fish larvae is more efficient. And that's what I'm going to answer. Okay. Um, things to consider is that uh, diatoms, they are planktonic, so they really don't move. They float with the currents. So diatom is not spending a lot of its energy during the day, so it has more energy to give, essentially. Tuna are active swimmers. They have to keep swimming. That's how they're going to breed, so that water will go over their gills. They're very fast swimmers. They're predatory fish, so they're constantly swimming. So they're using up a lot of their own energy during the day. Oh, excuse me. It's not even during the day. They're just using up a lot, like, in their life. And if we consider now the predator, when the shark even goes to, like, chase down the, the tuna, like, it's going to be using a ton of energy. It's, like, literally having to use a lot of energy in the process of, like, metabolizing and digesting the tuna. Fish larvae, when they're eating the diatom, like, fish larvae, same thing. They're, like, zooplankton. They, they do not have, like, 
their caudal fin get or the pectoral fins, like they're not really actively swimming. So fish larvae are also not using up a ton of energy, you know, for its day to day. Okay, so um, we'll say the fish larvae and the diatom, the diatom first. Okay, and then explain what this means. So there's less energy lost. Or there's more to give in that feeding relationship. Diatoms, I mean, they're microscopic. So they can be eaten in one bite. Where a Shark cannot eat a tuna in one bite. Like, no way, tuna are massive. Shark can't eat a tuna in one bite. And of the bites that it even does take, there's gonna be some like scraps and tuna pieces that fall out of its mouth and sink to the seabed or get eaten on their way down to the seabed. Oh, excuse me. Oh, all right, I'm tired. Shark tide times gonna be eaten in one bite. Um, diatoms are easily digestible or they don't have complex tissues things that do have complex tissues tuna tuna has um obviously it's bony skeleton that is not biomass that is not digestible um they have multiple different complex tissues they might have some spikes that are on um their scales like on the outside of their skin uh there's a lot of parts that aren't going to be able to be eaten and those that do get ingested oh my gosh excuse me those that do get in ingested the pieces of them that do get ingested um they're you know they're going to take energy for the shark to actually have to break that down so just not um the most efficient feeding relationship there Uh, within this mark too, we can also say that they can be eaten in one bite, but they can also um, can eat multiple in one bite. Like our biggest animals on earth are filter feeders and they feed at that first and second trophic, they feed on the first and second trophic level. Okay, and then we can mention where there is some energy lost, right? Because we do have 14.6 going, so where's the other 85.4? So there is just some energy loss, and this happens for every organism. Some NRG is lost in ingestion um, or waste. Ingestion is like fecal material, like fecal waste. You ingest solids, you ingest out solids. And some is lost in respiration or heat, heat is the product of respiration. So as that, it like takes energy to break down our food, but we eat food so that we can get energy. So chicken and egg scenario, suggest the impact on the pyramid of energy if the quantity of silicates in the ocean is reduced. Well, if we look back to the top, thank you, Jeremy. Um, so Diatoms require, which is right here, diatoms require silicates as an essential nutrient to make part of their cells. So if we are reducing silicates, it's a nutrient that diatoms need. And we know that diatoms are at the base of your trophic level. They're your producer in this situation. Then we are going to have um, obviously less nutrients for the diatoms to synthesize more biomass or reproduce. And this is what would be the impact on the pyramid of energy. So Essentially, we're going to see all of those bars reduce in size. And first, first, it would be the diatom box that would reduce first. And then everything would kind of follow suit. It's just one mark.
I know. I know. Um, okay. I give this to you in class. So this is, I guess the next question is experimental design. Um, you guys only have it for five marks. So this is like the main question right here. And um, in A-level, they're like 11 or 12 marks, which isn't a bad thing. Like these are easy questions to get marks on. As long as like you have some practice with it, this is not the first time you're looking at it. But um, things that you want to consider, and I made a mnemonic for these, and it doesn't make sense, but that's not what it's about. It's just about remembering. So these are the letters we needed to kind of remember, and I made up ID creams. I don't know what that means. I don't care. I don't care how you get it right. I just say get it right. So um, it's going to be your independent variable, your dependent variable. Um, mention controls, unless they ask you. And in this question, they ask you. you got to say you're going to do repeats. Uh, da, da, da. Perhaps you need to talk about errors, like where the data could be wrong perhaps, potential errors, um, averages, say that you're just going to take an average, methods, how you're going to do it, what are you going to measure, and then S is going to be safety. You need to be safe about it, and that also includes ethics, safety and ethics. Ethics are only included when you're using, like, living organisms. Um, real quick, y'all, so independent variable, this is, and I teach my students the acronym dry mix to help them remember what it means and then where is it going, like where on an axis it's going to go. So the independent variables, what are you testing, what are you changing? The dependent variable is what you're measuring, what your results or answers are going to be. So is it going to be, um, you know, temperature, is it going to be the, how fast something was done, is it going to be speed, so then you would measure a distance and then a time covered in that distance. Is it salinity? And then you'd use a salinometer and measure in parts per thousand. Uh, is it going to be a pH? So the the dependent variable is like the the answer to this. This is what you're getting data for. The methods is how you're physically going to do this. Use the term carefully. Like I will carefully pour blah blah blah. Um, carefully. Control variables have at least two. But variables are going to be kept the same throughout the experiment. The only thing you should be changing is the independent variable. Everything else should stay the same. You need to have the statement that says you're going to repeat the experiment for accuracy. And I say, my students know to say, you're going to repeat it at least five times. The experiment will be repeated, be repeated at least five times for accuracy. And then you can get that mark. Averages. After all the repeats, you're going to take an average or a mean of the data. And then if you want to be extra, you could say, and I'm going to apply a statistical analysis to see if the data is significant. Safety and ethics. So safety is going to be like, do the tools or devices have a hazard? Um, electrical cords, keep them away from water. That's an easy one. If you're using any glass that could break, take care not to cut yourself. Um, handle carefully to prevent breaks and cuts. If a hot plate is used, um, wear a rubber mitt. So you don't just say, don't burn yourself. Like, that's great. That's a warning. What are you going to do to make it safe? Um, if you're outside, so in the field, use sunscreen. Beware of tide changes. Beware of weather conditions. Beware of non-slip shoes. For ethics specifically, this is if you are using an organism. So what are you going to do to not harm or kill an organism, disrupt an ecosystem? Uh, dispose of water samples properly. Return organisms to the original habitat. Don't disturb breeding grounds. Um, in Florida, we live by, you know, we have a lot of turtles that use our beaches for um, their, their nests. So, you know, for taking a sediment sample, so avoid any nesting turtles or don't go out during a breeding season. And then occasionally um, you should be able to identify where there could be errors. So that's like evaluating the data. Is there any sort of errors available, like available? Is there any sort of errors you can identify? Where could things have gone wrong? Maybe the experimenter didn't use the same amount of effort during, you know, each test. Um, could a measuring tool have not been functional or, or faulty for different people reading the, the measurements, those types of things. Okay, and then for data table. Uh, you're gonna do this with a pencil and a ruler, of course. The first table, the first column, it always goes X and Y. So this is gonna be your X, this is your dependent variable. What you are testing, include units or you will, I think data table questions are only like two marks. You're gonna lose that mark if you don't have units. The second one is your y-axis. And I realized that I copy and pasted this today in class. Um, this is not what you're testing. This is what are you measuring?
you're going to want to make enough columns that there's five repeats. Do not include fake data. It's not necessary. They know that you did not do this experiment. They know it because they know you're sitting for that exam at the moment. You're not actually running out the experiment that they asked you to do. So don't include fake data. And so when students don't know that, it makes it harder because they're like now making up these arbitrary numbers that usually don't even make sense. So don't do it. Um, they might ask, what will a graph look like for this? So the x-axis, y-axis. This is your manipulated variable or your dependent variable. The y-axis is your, um, oops, my B, my B, my B. I would edit this, but it's just so much work. I won't. I'll just keep that mistake and correct it right now. Um, manipulated variable or the independent variable. The y-axis is the dependent variable or your response. It's what you're responding with, what the answer is going to be. And maybe they ask, like, how could you further this experimentation? Um, I haven't seen a specific exam question like that, but it is something to keep in mind from your own syllabus. The things that la are labeled PA, that means practical activity. These are the things that you should be familiar with that they can reference. So the freezing point of water, the I'm sorry, effective salinity on freezing point of water, you're going to want to use five different salinities. Okay, and then as salinity increases, freezing point will decrease. For this, you're going to be measuring the temperature at which water froze. Using a litmus indicator, universal indicator, pH pro to measure the pH. So maybe five different water samples, and you're going to use the three different methods. Okay, and then I have like what the outcome should be right there. Investigate the effect of light energy on the rate of photosynthesis. This is also the same standard in learning outcome and practical activity as in environmental, ACE environmental. So light intensity, we're going to do five different distances of a lamp to an aquatic plant. And as it photosynthesizes, we're going to count the bubbles of oxygen produced at each different distance for a period of one minute. And then we're going to repeat this like five times. And uh, we're going to repeat, yes, five, we're going to repeat each distance five times. We're going to have five different distances. I'll take an average. You should find that as the distance increases, it gets further away. The rate of photosynthesis decreases. Um, investigate the abundance and so the amount and distribution, how they're zoned of organisms in a littoral zone. Um, the independent variable would be like abiotic factors on a shoreline or like in a tidal zone. So maybe like amount of water or temperature, <clears throat> um, the effect of wind, maybe. Uh, exposure to sunlight. So what you could do, uh, counting the amount of organisms in a frame quadrat or mark recapture. And I didn't include the rest. That's my own heart. Um, could also do the line transects. And that's systematic, where you're counting regular intervals or continuous, where you're counting the entire length of the line. And I don't mean to say counting. It's not counting. It's you're just recording. So like if an organism literally touches the line, it's, are you here, are you not? Are you here, are you not? You write their name. <clears throat> you could also do the belt transect. And this one, you're looking at the abundance within the framed quadrat. So uh, marked intervals on your rope or your tape measure. And at, at those intervals, that's where you're going to lay down your quadrat. And then you're going to count the amount, or not count, you're going to actually estimate the percent coverage of an organism. <laughs> And you're going to use the AC4 scale. You don't have to memorize that. But it stands for, it's a species um, abundant, common, frequent, occasional, or rare. Okay. And that, again, is their percent abundance. So how much is in there? And you would do all of these things multiple times, five times. And we did this one in class. Um, the particle size and permeability. So you're going to have different sediment samples made from different shorelines. And you're going to measure the amount of water or the speed at which water goes through the sediment samples. So you have the distance of the actual sediment samples, and then you're going to time it and see how long it takes for water to go through. Or you could just, just do the time and see how long it takes for one drop of water to come out. Or you can let the entire water go through and see how long it takes. It's up to you. All right, that's just the basics on that. Um, many organisms have a planktonic stage to find the term plankton. This is straight from your syllabus and it says to find the term plankton. And the definition is microscopic organism. That drift in ocean currents or that have limited motility.
motility is like um, muscle contraction. So, right, so planktonic things are floaters, so they have to be above your thermocline. There's your thermocline. So they need to stay above here. And this is the, sorry, here it is. They need to st they stay above here. F. This thermocline causes a pretty good density difference. So things at the surface stay at the surface, things at the bottom stay at the bottom. Um, the, I don't remember what exam it was, um, yeah, I don't remember what exam it was, but the, there was an, a question, there was a question recently that said, define the term zooplankton. So still we're going to say they drift in ocean currents, they have limited motility, but they are consumers, primary consumers. And here's our experimental design. Some zooplankton show vertical up and down swimming responses towards light when a light stimulus is applied above them. And side note, I like to draw these out for my brain whenever I'm imagining this, since I can't see it in front of me, so I know what it would look like. Um, the zooplankton do not swim in darkness. I repeat, they do not swim in darkness. An investigation is carried out in a laboratory to compare the swimming speed. And that's what you're going to be measuring then. So that is your dependent variable. It's your response or the answer. The swimming speeds of zooplankton of different sizes. When you hear the word different, different is going to be a key word for the independent variable. This is what you're manipulating or what you're changing. It's the sizes. And what you're going to measure is their speed in response to white light. The student makes a hypothesis that the swimming speed of zooplankton is proportional to their size. So as their size increases, so will their swimming speed. And they give you some information so that honestly you can make accurate units. Okay, sorry, the maximum swimming speed of any zooplankton provided is 10 millimeters per second. And I personally like to write it like this. My students know this. I just like to see what's being divided. I, I visually like that. This S to the negative one is the same thing as the division, dividing seconds. The size range of the zooplankton is 10, 2 to 10 cent millimeters, 2 to 10 millimeters, which is literally um, on the paper you guys have that my students it is like the length of this word calculated that it that is 10 millimeters um side note if you printed this out my students have it in like in half of a page so it will be smaller okay um speed is distance over time so how far you go and how long it takes you list the equipment that you would require for this investigation so what i just like think in my head what we're gonna need we're gonna need like a tank or you can use beakers whatever Okay, and we're gonna need some like seawater. And then um, zooplankton, obviously. Um, we're gonna need a light source. If we're gonna be measuring speed or how long something takes, we need a stopwatch or a timer. I'm just going to act like these different shades of blue aren't bothering me because they're totally not. They're just totally not. All right, let's throw in some Fido's. Okay, and then I need to also do distance, so we should probably have like a ruler. And then you're going to need some sort of timer. Look at that. Almost looks like the beginning of an alien or a robot. Oh. A light source. Okay, so it's the equipment used, and you only need three. Stopwatch. Ruler. Um, a tank. 
for the zooplankton. I'm going to put zoo P. Is that cool? It's got to be cool. Light source. Um, maybe you need like a beaker to measure the water, something to measure the water. Water volume. That's how you say water amount. I think those are good. The key state three. So you can write again, four, three matter. That's it. Key variables to standardize in this investigation. This needs to be, um, this is things that like we would control, things that we're not going to change. So we're going to have the same and essentially the word same will go in front of almost all of these statements. Um, the only thing you want to change, the only thing that will be changing is the size of the zooplankton. That's it. So we want the temperature to be the same. Temperature affects enzyme activity, and if it's warmer, they might start swimming a little bit faster. So again, we're going to have the same um, pH, salinity. Everything else in the ocean needs in the ocean, and this water needs to be the same. Um, oxygen concentration. So maybe you need um, like an oxygen filter. We can include that here. Um, time to settle. So you're not just gonna like dump in your phytoplankton and then turn on a light. You're gonna you're gonna give them some time to settle. I don't know. I just have to draw a rim. Just trying to open it. Hi, Ali. So you chop them in. You gotta give them time to hit the bottom. So you should turn the light off because they don't swim when it's dark. They mentioned they do not swim in the darkness. They don't swim in the darkness. Do you have some macaroni? No, I just want to say something. Okay. Um, I heard that the lodge opened and I thought it was a stranger. Okay, it's not a stranger, it's a Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you okay? All right. Bless your heart. Um, same amount of water. And I don't want to say amount, that's terrible, volume of water in the tank. Um, the same light intensity or the same light source. So, I mean, I imagine though, like, what is the reality of that being different? I don't know. Like, wouldn't you just use the same flashlight or like bench lamp or something? Um, they should all, every time you do this test, there should be the same um, exposure time to the light. So if you're going to give them, you know, a certain amount of time to be in the tank and get exposed to the light and then you time them when they start swimming up, then they, they should all have that same amount of time. And then if you want to, um, uh, if, sorry, with that, they could also be the same distance traveled. So maybe you gave like a marking, a mark right here and you wanted to see like how long it took for them to swim just to that mark. They would need to be the same. Um, and then you could also mention that the same like amount of background light for all of these. So maybe you turn off the lights, but there's still like maybe an emergency light that's on in the corner. So background light would also be something you could also mention. Outline a method to compare the swimming speeds. So methods, it's five marks. And this is where we're gonna talk about how we're actually going to do this. We're gonna reference the averages. We are going to reference our safety um, and our ethics, um, the repeats. Okay. Place new plankton in um, the tank, or you could say in a beaker, whatever it is. And give them time to settle. <clears throat> okay, it does mention um, placing like a, I'll write it, place a glass sheet. I wouldn't think to do this but you don't want the temperature to change, but place a glass sheet between, thank you, Olivia, light source and tank, or the beaker, whatever you're using, so water temp doesn't change. But I mean, like, honestly, what the heck kind of flashlight are you using? Are you using like an infrared flashlight that gives off heat? 
I don't know. But, um, you know, whatever. One degree Celsius is one degree as well, man. Anyway, but I don't, like, things like this. Don't stress yourself out over, like, I wouldn't think of it. Yeah, I wouldn't think of it either. We're fine. We're totally fine. Switch on the light. And then we're going to record the time. And I always mention, like, what's the unit in seconds? To swim. And you could do a set distance. And then you'll have distance over time. You calculate a speed. So maybe, again, like, your distance is right here. How long does it take them to go to that area? I put just that. To stance. Um, or you could say, um, you could say the backwards too. You could say record, um, like record the distance, like so measure how far they swam in a certain period of time, which would also give you, it would be the same thing, that give you the same speed, distance over time, but you're just saying, okay, here's 10 seconds and you're starting it, um, you're starting stopwatch and then you just see how far they went within that 10 seconds. So that's fine. And then we're going to do this. Um, they say repeat three times. I don't like that. I always go five, always go five because then you know for sure that no one's going to be like, oh, would you like to do more repeats? That's not really enough. So I have other reasons for why I wanted to say five, but, and obviously the more averages, the better. Repeat the method, the methods five times and find the mean. Um, repeat the investigation or the experiment. Um, and this is when you're looking at the different sizes. So you want to see if there is any correlation between size and swimming speed. So it's at least three. So maybe you want to say five different sizes, but three minimum. Or you can give specific sizes, which is why they gave you this um, data up here. The size range of the zooplankton is 2 to 10 millimeters. So maybe you wanted to say repeat investigation with 2 millimeter, um, 4 millimeter, 6 millimeter, 8, and 10 millimeters. So now you have five um, size zooplankton. And to measure them, I feel like this should have been introduced a little bit sooner, but we're good. Um, measure each zooplankton weather ruler. You can also take a picture of them and then measure it electronically. <laughs> now we need to do some safety. So if we're not using a flashlight, and this is the benefit to not, what if you were using like uh, a desk lamp? Of course, it's got a plug. Plugs are good to be able to incorporate in this because, especially if there's water, you don't want to electrocute yourself. And that is always something that you can start bringing in because if you can talk about not electrocuting yourself, then you get a safety point. It's not like you're going to electrocute yourself with a battery um, flashlight. So if it was a desk lamp, we would say keep electrical cords. away from water. Um, handle. Speakers. Or glassware. OK. 
carefully to avoid cuts. And then um, because zooplankton is an organism, we need to be ethical. So um, dispose of zooplankton ethically. Um, we could say return to their habitat. Um, if you like keep them in a tank in your class or something. Draw a suitable table and record the result to record the results for the methods described. Include full headings and units. Gotta use a pencil and a ruler on this one. So you had again it's your X and then your Y, and that's always how data tables go. How does the X affect the Y? Our X was the different sizes. And they told us the unit millimeter and the Y was how fast, fast is distance over time. So this is going to be swimming speed. And that was millimeters per second. Okay. And I always tell my students, don't cut yourself off here. So like, don't already square yourself in. And now you're limited to just that space. Um, I would make your final closings of that whenever you're done writing. And that's what I mean, because you don't want to cut yourself off and then be writing it so tiny. It just looks like poor planning and sloppy. Stakes are too high. Everything is going to be perfect. Including that line. All right, we're going to pretend like this is then jacked. It gets a little crooked. Okay, and we want one, two, three, four, and five. We want to have at least five lines a good rule to have and then um don't include fake data you don't have the data unless you're told it's not appropriate to do fake data the spaces in between do not have to be perfect i think you can eyeball it pretty well and if you realize that you've done five rows and then you still have some excess down here erase it because you're going to be using a very good eraser <sighs> You had the big version of this on Monday's test. But if you did practice this question in your class or anything like that, my students did the week before, thank goodness. Um, this state two ways answered the entirety of that question yesterday on your paper one. Okay, so two ways, obviously I'm just gonna go through this real quick. Um, I'm gonna do a T, a T chart just to be faster. which is acceptable. Okay, so we have cartilaginous fish and then bony fish. So they have denticles, bony fish have scales, gill slits, operculum. No visible lateral line. Visible lateral line. Swim bladder. No swim bladder. In fact, um, cartilaginous fish have very oily liver, and that oil makes them less buoyant, and so they will float. And then, obviously, we have a bony skeleton. It's not just that they have bones. whoop de doo So do we. We also have cartilage. Cartilaginous fish have cartilage. I also have cartilage. You have cartilage. So that's, it's about the skeleton. Cart, cartilaginous skeleton. Just pretend I wrote the whole thing. Okie doke. Those are the differences. Um, state the location of the benthic zone. 
I wrote underneath it, I wrote on it. Um, it's on the ocean floor or seabed. All right, let me see this picture of a sea skate, obviously cartilaginous, and they see the anatomy of some of it. Um, the eyes are on the top of its head, which is good because they, you know, swim at the bottom. So, you know, they're like down here. Seabed. So if they have eyes at the top, it's not like they're going to be able to see, see on the bottom. That wouldn't be good. Um, they also have a little bit of their um, spiracles on the top. And so that allows them to um, take in some oxygen. Not oxygen, what am I saying? Take in water. Okay. Yay, dichotomous key. All right, you always start at the first number one option. Looking at five species of sea skates, A, B, C, D, and E. And so I identify, they want you to identify the binomial name or their scientific name or their species name. All those mean the same thing. And so the first thing is a sharp snout. Now, let me tell you, before like you start doing a ton of semantics, like I felt the same way. What does a sharp snout look like? What's not a sharp snout? Look at the five that they give you and compare it from that. They don't expect you to be sea skate like biologists. That's not what you're doing. So look at their snout. Snout was told to you right here. They labeled it. Also notice their label lines. They're so straight and they are touching the area that they are labeling. And then all of the labels are written horizontally as they should be. So here's a snout. So just compare them. Sharp snout or rounded snout. We're looking at, it says identify C. So comparatively, they're gonna have a more rounded snout. Because this is sharp, B is sharp, um, A is sharp, comparatively. Go to three. Um, a row of thorns from the head down the body or no thorns down the body? Thorns, okay. And so that's an easy one. Row of thorns down the head of the body. That's the species name. We're going to write it like that. You need to make sure that the genus it's capital and the species is lowercase. You don't need to write it italics, but that's how it needs to be written. Two adaptations of skates living in the benthic zone, so living at the seabed. Um, they're camouflaged. You can see that just from their coloration here. If you didn't get that, that's okay. Okay, they're not they're not very vibrant, but they're camouflaged. Um, they are flattened. They can stay low. So, like we would say, they're flattened dorsally, which means dorsal is top of. So they are flat that way. Same with shelled organisms and things that live at a sandy shore. They are also flattened and they have camouflage. Um, they have protruding eyes. You don't have to say protruding though. You could also just say eyes on the top of their head. Mouth on the underside. For feeding, they do feed below themselves. You can tell that's where their mouth is. And they have spiracles at the top to take in water. But that's, don't have to mention that. Okay, so getting ready for the next question, which is the graph. Prepare to do a graph. Um, so this is when you have, this is from my class, this is like January. All right, for a line graph, you're doing numerical data with more numerical data comparing it. Or quantitative data, quantitative data. The exception are years. Years are typically categories to do a bar graph. No titles. These do not require titles. Um, all right, typically four marks and the following. You need axes labeled fully. You're going to do that identically from what Cambridge gives you. Whatever they write, you are copying. This is your time to play dry. So whatever they give you, you also duplicate.
Um, copied exactly. Um, a linear scale, which means you're counting evenly. So you can count by ones, twos, fives, tens, a hundred. You can by point fives. Um, you're counting evenly. You're not skipping around. And you're not, you know, this is your data. Two, 10, 30, 50, 70. That's not what you're labeling the size of the graph. You're not going two, 10, 30, 50, 70. Because that would mean you're going from two to 10. So you're counting by eights. But then you go 10 to 20. So now you're counting, or 10 to 30. So you're counting by 20s. It's not. It's not even, it's not um, linear. Hello, there. Hello Ladybug. Um, you gotta use at least half of the graphing space or more, which goes back to the scale mark. You have to be able to space this out so that you're gonna use um, at least half the space or more. You know, we want some tiny little trashy graph. You wanna be able to take up a big space, show your data. Um, so the easiest way to do this, so if you're ever like, I don't know what to count by, this is what you do. Count the number of dark lines that you have on the graph. And Cambridge graphs are really great that they give you really good visible lines here. And this is actually like a smaller copy of an actual like graph space get on an exam. Do you need help? Okay. Um, count the dark lines on the graph and then split it up, divide by your largest data value. And so I'll show you um, on the exam question that's on here, we'll do it. And you have to include a zero at the axis, even if you're breaking the scale or even if you're breaking the graph, if you're starting with really big data and you have to break the graph, um, who cares? You still have to include a zero. Just do it, do it, do it. Um, yeah, just the feedback I've gotten in different Cambridge trainings from Cambridge trainers themselves, we need to include a zero. If one says include the zero and another one says, no, it's okay, I'm definitely going with the one who says include it because they're the ones who would count it wrong. Um, your data needs to be plotted correctly. So the ways to plot, the only ways to plot your data on a line graph are with a dot with a circle or an X. You are not gonna get marked if you do this. If you find yourself doing that, you need to have a dot with a circle around it. The range of error is so small, there pretty much is none. It's tiny. You can only make plus or minus one half of a box mistake. Half of a box? I can't even make it with that. It's literally too big. Okay, half a box looks like this. That's your range of error. That. Um, again, using a ruler, yeah, I do this all the time, so I'll show you on, on the one we do. So use a ruler and notate how much each square is worth on your graph, um, but use a ruler to make sure that you're getting like the exact spot. Lastly, your points must be connected with ruled straight lines. You have to use a ruler. Never connect your line to the origin or to the zero unless you have the data. I have a lot of students who would see, um, mm, let's see, like they see this line right here and they're like, oh, I don't like that. It's not complete. And they bring it down for no reason. Don't do that. And these are just practices that we did in class. Or, you know, the data was right here and that's where it started. They just bring it to a zero because they want to. Don't, if you don't have the data for it, then you don't have the data for it. It's fine. Okay, and then um, if you have to graph two different lines on the same graph, so it means different shorelines, different temperatures, whatever, if this happens, you must create a key. And you're just going to go off on the side of your graph, like right here, and you're gonna say key. Temperature one is the one that has a dot with a circle. Temperature two is the one with an X. Now, this graph actually does not require two lines, but sometimes you don't know exactly where to put it. You just put it off on the side. There you go. So you can go on the margins of the graph itself. So again, you could just do this, temperature one, temperature two, or you could split them up by the type of line that you're using. So maybe um, the data point one or whatever first data you're doing, that's gonna be made with a dotted graph or dotted line. There you go. And then the other one maybe is solid, but with a ruler. 
Okay, so here's your X. How does your X affect the Y? Death is always what's controlling the factors in the ocean. It's not salinity that's making the ocean or the estuary deep. That doesn't make sense. So like if it rains, it's gonna get shallower. Bless you, baby. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. It's depth. And it's not that depth is making it saltier. It's just depth is the reason for why there's so much towards the bottom because it's sinking. Salinity is the measurement or the concentration of dissolved solids in the water. All right. And salinity is at different depths in an estuary. Estuary is a partially enclosed, which means it's also partially open then, right? So it's, it's open to the influence of the ocean, so seawater. It's also open to influence of freshwater rivers. Partially enclosed tidal body of water. Tidal because it's influenced by tides. All right. And so we have our depth and our X, and then we have the salinity. And typically when we see things like this, but this is just an estuary, it's not the ocean, we usually see this as like a halo climb, right? We usually see this. And that makes sense because we can view this as the surface of the water, right? There's your waves. And then, you know, what's going at the surface all the way down to the seabed. What's the most obvious thing I've ever done. That's just how we're used to seeing it. Okay. Four marks. Let's do it. First, we're going to label. That's your X, X, your Y. Um, y has a long tail. And then there's the X axis, if you don't remember. So depth, and it's identically what they have here, depth in meters. And then salinity measured in parts per thousand. Even if you don't know the unit, write it exactly as they have it. Um, you could also put PPT or the like symbol for it. Okay, we're not breaking the graph. You would break the graph if there is very big data. So for example, if the depth started for some reason at a thousand, if that happened, um, you know, and then let's assume all these are also a thousands, right? So you would need to be like, oh yeah, zero does exist. And then maybe right here, you're starting your thousand. And so you would go, eh, er, eh, er. so a little Harry Potter situation, which means that this is an accordion and I pulled this open and I stretched it out. All those other numbers would be there, but they're not a part of the data set. So they're not important and we don't include them. I could also break the graph by doing a symbol like that. Little railroad tracks. Okay, zero so at the origin. And we have depth 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Perfect. So 12 is the biggest number I need to fit in. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six lines that I need to label. This is actually a very perfect, 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 lovely graph and super easy. So you have 12 things and you need to split it up six ways. You're going to be counting by twos. Two, four, six, eight, ten, and 12. You're doing this with a pencil. And the next thing I like to do, because I want to make sure, and even though it, this situation does not, ne it's not necessary because my depth are these values every two meters. Assuming it wasn't, what if I had three, right? Or what if I had a 2.5? Well, I want to know what each box is worth. And so that's going to be helpful for probably the majority of your graphs because truthfully, it's not common that it's so beautiful like this. So I look and I see what I'm counting, how many there are. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten boxes. And then those ten boxes get you to the number two. So essentially I say, all right, I have um, zero to two. So I have the number two and I split it up ten ways. There's 10 boxes making up to the two to get it there. Two divided by 10 is gonna be 0.2. And I write, like kind of, you know, for myself down here, each box equals 0.2. It's not inappropriate to do that. I just write it small and out of the way. And then because myself in math don't trust, I count it. I say, okay, here's 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0.6, 0.81. 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, 1.82. And I'm like, all right, self, you did it again. Numbers work. Get out of town. 
get rid of any of my work. I didn't want Cambridge to know that I even thought for a second. So you're not using any color on this. I'm only doing it to show you. Salinity goes from two up to 30. So those values are nothing we need to break the graph for. And so I need to get to the biggest number 30, so my biggest data set. And I'm gonna do the same thing. So I have one, two, three, four, five, and six lines that I could split up the number 30 with. That's gonna be pretty obvious. Let's assume that I got a number that was like a decimal. Let's say it says split it up by 3.8. Ew, no, we're not counting by 3.8s right here. That would be insane. Instead, you round up. So maybe you wanna count by fours. See if you can push it up even further. Can you count by fives? Do yourself a favor, self love. Count by fives, it's so much easier. Then that makes each of these boxes worth 0.5. It's easier. And, but of course, before you like, you know, really marry that idea, make sure that if you are rounding up and counting by a higher number that you are at least able to use half of the graph space or more. On this graph, um, you need to use at least this amount of space right here. So that direction and going in your other direction, this is halfway. So you would need to use at least this. This too small, it's still too small. Um, great, okay. Thank you, all right. If you've already labeled it, perfect. You can skip forward a little bit. And then I'm gonna do the salinity, because that's what's being measured. The depth is changing and salinity is what's being measured. So two to 30. And we have six lines. So I go 30. And I need to split up six ways. Five, so I can cut by five, five. Ten. And I, before I write this, I. Because you're not doing this, you're not doing this in pens. You could always raise it, but I always try it out first. 5, 10, 15, 20, 30. And then again, I like to be like self. What is each box going to be worth in case they have any in between? I'll grace shower. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And so I go from 0 to 5. So a value of 5 and I'm splitting it up 10 ways. Cut it up 10 little, 10 little ways. And this is me 0.5. And then I say to self, self, okay, give yourself a hint. Each box here is worth 0.5. And that helps me just not make mistakes when I'm actually putting values in. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, just so you guys know, in order for these videos to be possible, there's a whole team. I'm just letting my viewers know that in order for them to be these be possible, there's there's a whole team supporting. I should add my Venmo or something. Thanks. Absolutely, they can hear that. <laughs> um, all right, explain the pattern shown by the graph. Um, for this one, oh, I, I guess I should graph it. <laughs> I'll do it in color so you can see it better. Um, all right, depth is zero, and then salinity is two. So my depth is zero, and then my salinity is two. And I already know, because I'm like, oh gosh, it's five. We need to find out where two is. So we have 0 0.5, 0 0.5, one, 1.5, two. And so you can graph on an axis. That is fine. You can do that for sure. Um, Dot, and I'm gonna put a circle around it, and we're not doing like some like obnoxious dot in a circle. That, woo, gosh, that's ooh, way too much space. This is covering way too many boxes. And you can see they have crowns on each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, check her off. Depth of two, and then salinity of three. Here's my two, and then salinity of three. Well, half of five, five split up in two, obviously it's two and a half. So it's totally fine to put the in-betweens there where this would be 7.5, Um, you look at that data again. Okay, two and three, depth is two. So here's two and a half, this is gonna be three. I'll finish that game, okay? 
depth of four, salinity of four. So here's four, and then five, four and a half, four. And I'm definitely going to get rid of any of these points I don't need. Those little, those little helpful dots. Uh, my fours are done. Six and 26. So depth of six. That's a really big gap. Especially just for six meters. That's a very big gap. Seems ridiculous. It's like not really enough to be like a legit halo climb either. Um, six and then 26. So I got... Yikes. This is where I would throw in a ruler. And so just so you know that you're going the right place, because you can get dizzy with all these lines. Six, and then I need 26. Look at that, just working perfectly. I wonder how long I am. Super, super, super long. And I can get longer. Just about to just scrap this, but you know what I mean. You know, because your ruler isn't going to be um, moving all over the place. Six and then 26. Here's 25, 25 and a half, and 25, 25 and a half. Here's the 26. Go! All right. So depth of eight and 28. Here's my eight. And then all the way up. Well, I know where 26 is, so 26 and a half. 27, 27 and a half, 28. Right? Yes. That looks a little bit too long for me, too big. Modest dots with a circle, very modest. 10 and then 29, 10, go up here, 29. So I know this is 28, 28 and a half, 29. And that makes sense because then 29 and a half, 30, and we're only going 30, and depth of 12 and 30. So this is my last one, and this is 12, and then 30 at the top. You can graph on the axis. And now I am going to connect them with ruled straight lines. So ruler and the straightest lines you can imagine. You are not using color. I'm only doing this so you can see it. Great. Great. I connect dot to dot to dot to dot. If you don't have a ruler, that shouldn't be the case. You literally should know to bring a ruler to this test. Um, if you don't have a ruler, then you find the edge of a pencil or something because there's no sense in missing a mark on a Cambridge exam because you didn't bring a ruler. Like that's, that's just too much. Um, before you turn this in, I would just get rid of any of these stray lines. It's totally fine to have these in between counts. That's not a problem. You're also allowed to, you know, have these little box hints down here. That's not an issue either. Yes. All right, and that's that. Beautiful graph. No, 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 no. Y'all, we're almost done. Olive Grace. Olive Grace. Please. I cannot stop this game. Hey, I was trying to the guy. He's doing really good. <laughs> Respect it. She took over first place and just been running away with. All right. Describe the pattern shown by the graph. So this is something that's daunting to do is to talk about um, data, it. but it's yeah. going to be, um, essentially you could also look at it on your data chart, but oh, it seems like I'm it's going to be like, as your X does what it's doing, what is your Y doing? No one as the X does what it's doing, what is your Y doing? And so look at your numbers. As the X, and you're going to say increases or decreases. No one else came to eat The Y, and you're going to insert their names, not the actual X and Y. You're going to write their names in, and then increases or decreases. So how does the X value, which is going to be depth, affect the Y? I'm the biggest, and I didn't mm -hmm. As depth, that's my X. Ah, 
And what are these numbers doing? They are going 0, 2, 4, 6, all the way up to 12, where you can see here these numbers are increasing. These numbers are increasing. Then the salinity, 2, 3, 4, 26, 28, 29, 30, they are increasing. And when you see something ridiculous like this, like that, 4 to 26, okay, wow, like something seems weird. Because your depth didn't jump that high. You just went 2 meters every single depth. You didn't have that crazy of a jump, but then salinity just did something nuts, which makes it seem like it's not that great of data. Could have been a mistake. It's depth increases, which means it's getting deeper. If depth is a number and it's increasing, it's getting deeper. Okay, and we definitely, again, when you see data that's like that 4 to 26, so 2, 3, 4, 26, that's insane. And then it's 26, 28, 29, 30, like it doesn't follow any pattern, like what happened here? Okay, so the step is increases salinity changes, and we're gonna say there's the a very great change in salinity at four to six meters. Um Salinity doesn't abruptly change like that. Abruptly change above the four meters, nor does it below the six meters. State the name given to that region. So this might be why. And I'm gonna stop the screen from moving. There I am, okay. Now we'll turn it and see it in a way that we can imagine. If this is the surface of the ocean, and down here is your seabed, well now this might look a little bit more familiar. This, it would be the region area or the column of water, this area right here with the greatest change in salinity with depth. And my, that's my bad, y'all, because maybe you do need a screen to flip for that. No, hold on. Plus it. Plus it day. We'll just undo what I just did. Just forget it. Just forget it. Um, I can't turn it. Okay, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm literally, I'm turning my iPad as if it's going to turn the whole thing. It's not. Okay, I'm just moving on from it. But this is, this is your halo sign. And up here is the surface of the water. Oh, we're so close. We only have that math question left. State the name given to that region. This is the halo sign. Use your graph to estimate the salinity to depth of 5.2. And this is why we need to know what each box is worth. Here's four, here's five. And each box is by 0.2. So it's almost like they knew that we were gonna be counting this way. Here's 5.2. And the way you do this is you're gonna use your ruler and you're going to measure. And here I'm gonna bring out the untrusty ruler. You're gonna put it on that 5.2 line. Right there it is. And you want to look to see where it is hitting the um, your salinity gradient, the salinity line. Okay, for me it's right here. It's on that pink line. And they say read what the salinity is. So it's right here, and I'm gonna read across and And so now if I count here, remember I'm counting by 0.5s on this one, and this is why I put these right here because I will constantly be like, wait, what am I counting by? What am I counting by? 
Um, we know we're counting by 0.5s. And so this is 15 and a half, 16 and a half. So that answer is going to be about 16 and a half. I just want to make sure that that's fitting my line. So that is like where my line is touching. It's actually going to be like right here. Oops. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. 15 and a half, 16 and a half. So I'm like, I'm literally in between like that. 16 and a half, 17. And that's because my pen that I'm using is a little thick. And that's not Cambridge thin. And they already gave the unit. Yes, baby girl. What's wrong, baby girl? That's what I said before. Why might it not be accurate? There's a large change, like within that two meters. Not at two meters depth, but like a two meter depth range, like from that four to six. And we don't have like the data in between. We only have four and six, we don't have five. Like what about four and a half? Um, asteroids with salinity gradient shown only forms where there's a low tidal range. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Suggest a reason for this. So a estuary with a salinity gradient shown. So yeah, this is a massive, massive salinity gradient. Only shows um, where there's a low tidal range. So the difference between high and low tide is low. And the reason for this is gonna be um, because you're not gonna have as much mixing. The difference between your high and low tide is low. you're not going to have as much mixing. So it's, there's going to be like a constant flow of like a little bit more seawater. So perhaps you have like a, a longer period of time for evaporation to occur. Fresh water will stay floating um, on surface. Um, or the reverse argument, you can have um, saline water sinking. So yeah, so if there was a high tidal range, you would, the high tide is high, the low tide is low, like you would get water mixed and replenished frequently. All right, the last one. And so for this question, um, I actually have this. If I can't not cool it up, not there. Same thing, I literally just did it. I have this. So it took me hours to make these last year. And so if you wanna buy it, I have it here. Um, so you could do it with me. So you go to Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, that link is there. And so I have this for um, the Spearman's rank. And I also geez, have this for the Simpsons Index. There we go. Simpsons Index of Biodiversity. Um, they took me hours, and so if you're a teacher, you can buy them, then you can use them, you know, for all your classes, whenever. 
Um, but yeah, there's the Spearman's rank, scaffolded notes walking you through. And this question, this exam question doesn't actually have um, Spearman's rank on it. This one is going to have stem sense index of biodiversity, but um, I know it's been asked before on some of those videos that I have on YouTube, like where can I get this document? You can get it right here and it's yours forever. So it's teacher pay teachers and you can just search my name or I think my name is like Ace Marine Devo. Sounds about right. Okay. Y'all are almost done. Okay, a report was made that scientists to uh, that an invasive tree, so it is not local, so it's not, not native and it is harmful. Um, Nypha fruticans have become a st um, established in an area of mangrove forests on the west coast of Africa. An invasive species is an organism that is not native to an area and easily spreads to cause ecological damage. So they could overpopulate the area and take resources, etc. Scientists investigated, um, they use this hypothesis, the presence of an invasive species will reduce biodiversity. So they're saying if you have an invasive species there, the biodiversity in the area is going to be reduced. And so essentially we're going to use Simpson's index of biodiversity to see um, what the biodiversity sizes are in these two areas. And this is, and they said it's to an area of the, of the mangrove forest, not all of it. Scientists studied two areas of mangroves of equal size. The invasive nipa species was present in area Y, but not X. And when I read things like that, I'm like, yeah, you're going to forget. So area Y, it has the invasive species, but X doesn't have it. Large mangrove species were identified and the number of each species of plant in each transect was recorded. So it seems like they didn't do, um, like, nope, they did the number of them in each, in each species, or yeah, in each transect. So maybe they did the belt, but it'd been a big belt, a big, big quadrant for that. All right, so the first step is calculating um, big N, which is this one right here. You want the total number of all the species all together. And so we have, um, 24, 19, 24, 0, 3, and 50. If you add those all up, you will get 120. And they already did area Y for you. And if you're like, yeah, you don't know how to do this, um, can I have that video? I can walk you through it. Just say like, calculate the total number of species. I don't read the question. And mangrove area X, record it. And additionally, all these, will be, these formulas will be given to you. So the formula and their variables, they think capital letter N is the total number of individuals of all the species. So all of the different organisms or different individuals in a species, add them all together. Where little n is then in each different species, it's the number of individuals in there. So you have the total of all of them put together and then just in their individual species, how many do you have? Okay, just numbers. It's just numbers and letters. Next step then, it says use the formula and the data from table 6.1. So right here, we're going to be using these numbers. Okay. Um, to complete table 6.2 and calculate the Simpson's index of diversity for area Y, notice that you don't have to do the whole thing when it's done for you. So there is like actually no data in this one because you're not doing the sum of that. All you're doing is you take the number of each species and we'll have to do it for area Y. And then you're gonna divide it by the total amount of each species. And then in this box, you see that it's the square. So we're now gonna be doing this part. First, we need to do just the little n over the big N. We need to do it for the Niper fruticans and the area Y. And so we do still need that other box here, the other data chart. So here's that one, that's the invasive. In area Y, so we do see that it's spread in area Y, but again, it's not in area X. So 53 and the total total is 109. So 53 specifically for that species, Okay, and then um, we'll work that out. And then Rhizophora harrisoni in area Y. 
All right, it has, and this is area Y, we have zero, and big N, the total of all of them is 109. Let's just go ahead and do that right there. Rhizophora racemosa. Area Y is 35. What happens when my AirPods die? Oh, wait. Oh, wait. I still got one. We're going to make it. Okay. Third. Gosh, I hope, it, I hope it's getting my audio. This has happened in the past. We're good. Persevere. This means this has taken way too long. Um, we're going to divide those. And then we have to square them. And they're looking that you do divide it so that they're going to be checking that data. So 53 over 109, you're going to get 0.490. 35 over 109 is 0.32. We don't need to do the summation here. This symbol is a sigma. It's a Greek letter, and it means put it all together. Um, it is a glorified plus sign. And then the mangrove area Y. So what we just calculated right here, and then we need to square it. So that's 0 0.03 squared, 0 0.13 squared, 0 0.04 squared, 0 0.49 squared, 0 squared, 0.32 squared. 0.49 squared is going to be um, 0 0.2401. And if you're doing this, um, the acceptable range here is, uh, depending on what value you use, like if you did stop that at 0.49 and you didn't, and you, you know, I don't know, or you, you use like the entire decimal answer, um, you could have 0.2334 all the way to 0 0.2364. Um, the rhizophora racemosa, 0.32 squared, you're going to have 0 0.1024. All right, and then if you add them all together, so this plus this plus this plus this plus this plus this, the summation, this is the total of adding these all up now. So you divide it, then you squared, and now you're going to add them all up. You will get um, point three six one nine and that's the sum of that if you look back at the formula you need to do for the index one minus that answer the sum of and so now we just, just subtract that number by one one minus point three six one nine and that's for area y um, it equals 0.6381. Doesn't have a unit with it, that just is. That's its index of biodiversity. Now, if you look at mangrove area X, it is 0 0.7171, and area Y has 0 0.6381. So obviously we can see that um, it's not by a ton, it really isn't, it's only by about 0.6381. 079 um <clears throat> it's not that much less but these numbers for d and you need to know this for your test range from um zero to one the closer you are to one the more biodiverse like an area would assume to be so this is coral reef status um rocky shore they are more stable they're going to be surviving if there is like some kind of ecological or, or like yeah and like environmental interruption you're going to have more complex food webs um there's more niches for organisms. There's more, uh, hypothetically, more biodiversity with the bigger that number is. Not even bigger, but the closer it is to one. First, it's further away. This is going to be an area that you're going to have to have a lot of adaptations for. You're going to have to, um, like a sandy shore, or which is easily erodible and constantly erodible. It's changing. It's not stable. Or something that's extreme, like a hydrothermal vent. Um, you're going to need a lot of different adaptations to live there. And if an organism does disappear that could mess up the food web really bad oh excuse me um 
if there is some kind of like ecological disturbance, it might not be able to um, to like recoup from that. Last question. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay, and so back to their hypothesis, the presence of an invasive species reduces biodiversity. Okay. If we consider while I'm on this page, in area X, you have one, two, one, two, three, four, five different species. And it's area Y, you have one, two, three, four, five, again, also five different species. Their um, biodiversity index, though area Y is lower, it's not that much lower. We would definitely need to be do more more tests and have more data collected. So the extent is um, where is it good and where is it not good? So where does it support? Where does it not support? So the diversity index for area and index is underlined which means it has to be there y is lower and so if you could use data use data all you have to do is subtract to be able to get like the data mark for this 0 0.079 that's how much it's lower by that looks too sloppy for me Um, which is not a large amount. Um, I don't, in A level, there's more statistics, but you could, if, if you're familiar with this, you can mention it. Um, should or need to, should do a, um, like significance test to see if it's statistically significant or even like a, uh, standard error. Significance test. Okay. Um, the species richness, it's a term you need to know, is unchanged. So um, Simpson's index of biodiversity measures not just the species richness, which is the different species that you have, but also the evenness, which is the amount of organisms in each species. Because if you have, you're like, oh, I have so many species in this habitat, there's just so biodiverse, but then you only have like one of a species or and all the species you're bragging about has like one or two individuals, that's not very even. And that's called evenness, the amount. This answer we're giving is, is referencing um, species richness, which is how many different species you have. And so there's five different species in X and also five different kinds of species in Y. And we would expect for, you know, really a significant difference in a biodiversity index. If, if you were really gonna have low biodiversity, then that area should probably have very low species richness comparatively to another. Um, you can talk about um, specific things like uh, there's two species um, that were reduced by a large amount in area Y. Um, one species that disappeared, but their number is low anyways in area X. So it's already low in area X. What does it doesn't necessarily mean is because of the invasive species in Y. Um, this would be the the Parasani one. So again, that one is. It's, it's three, so it's low here, but now it's not in this one. So it's already low. There's only three. What's to say that it's that this is caused by the invasive species when X doesn't have an invasive species, yet that number is very low. You also, um, yeah, that's, that's the species I'm talking about. That's the one that disappeared. Um, two species are reduced by a large number here and here in area Y. So that's something else you can talk about. And you can reference a species too. In area Y, two species have been reduced. So use the data you're given. 
by a large number. And then you're going to actually use their data. So it's going to be A, Orium, and then D. Linatus. Again, you can also talk about the Rhizophora harrisoni. It, um, it's, it disappeared. It's not in the area Y anymore, but it's also very low in area X. So it's not going to necessarily say that it's the invasive species that's causing that in Y. All right, and we need, all in all, there needs to be um, more tests, we need more tests in more areas. We could say more data needs to be collected. All right, guys. Um, this actually will unfortunately be the last video I'll have time to do before you guys um, are going to have your paper two test. Um, Consider the beginning of this when I went over my predictions for paper two. Uh, I have an A-level test I need to start getting ready for and grilling on that one. So um, good luck. And if I was able to help you, um, I'm blessed to do so. Thank you. And um, good luck to you guys. And if you're a senior, congratulations. And good luck to all your future successes and your future plans. Make good choices. Thank you.